Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. I hope you're getting this for the podcast, Alicia, because the cuckoo clock is running. So... This episode is simultaneously super exciting for me, as well as a bit nerve-wracking, and I'm going to try to not make it the Alicia Tells Sappy Stories About How Much She Admires Nick episode. Anyone that knows me can say how much Nick Barker has played a huge role in my hoof care journey. I first met Nick in 2015, when I showed up at her farm in England to see her rehab facility. It was only slightly stalkerish. We had made plans for me to go there and she was very accommodating and hospitable and she happily answered the dozens of questions I asked her. To put it in context a bit, Nick runs a rehab facility primarily for navicular diagnosed horses. I had a navicular horse and Google brought me to her Rockley Farm blog. I kept seeing story after story of these doomed horses returning to competition, eventing, show jumping, fox hunting. So I had to see what she did. Like I've said before, if there was a way to help my horse, I needed to know about it. Yeah, the thing with, the thing is, when you say anything to do with Nick and Rockley, everyone pops up because everyone's just so happy with, you know, getting their horses back. Yeah, I mean, well, Nick has changed my life. She saved Buddy's life, so I owe her everything. All right, well, why don't you start with your name and uh, how you know Nick Barker? Okay, so my name's Krista Jones, and I know Nick because I sent my horse to Rockley in 2012, I think. 2012. Okay, so my name is Jackie Nicholas. I live in Chelmsford in Essex in the UK. Um, And I got introduced to Nick Barker really only through um, Facebook groups because I was just looking for an answer and I didn't like any of the other options on the table. Okie dokie. It's Carol Proctor and my horse Cayman is a Rockley Rehab. So my name is Annette Andresen. Um, I originally met Nick, a friend's horse had really severe navicular in both his front feet um, and I actually helped my friend drive him down to Rockley so I think that was probably in 2010. Um, and then a few months later my own horse was diagnosed with uh, navicular in his in his off four, his right four foot four foot hoof. Um, not nearly as bad, but um, the vet sort of taught me through various options, but I already knew in my mind there's only one place he's going. Um, I put him straight on the trailer. Um, very lucky that Nick had a space and took him straight to Rockley in July 2011. Okay, um, my name is Anita Street. Um, I know Nick because I sent my horse to Rockley Farm. Um, that was three years ago in 2016. Yeah, so um, so hi, yeah, my name's um, Will Davis. Um, I'm based in the UK and um, I initially contacted Nick, I guess maybe four years or so ago. And the concept was that I had um, a horse that I, it was about 13 year old horse um, that I had from three uh, and he had been diagnosed navicular. I tried kind of everything um, method approached by the vet and the farrier over a year and everybody had given up and basically I was desperate not to lose the horse um, and so I was kind of searching the internet as much as I could to just find you know was there anything I could do um, to try and kind of save this horse so I started to come across a few links and things on the web and, and that's how I got hold of Nick. All right, so I'm here with Nick Barker from Rockley Farm, and she just did a really great clinic in uh, New York on Long Island with some horses out here, and um, I just wanted to spend some time interviewing her for this podcast. So I wanted to start with asking you a little bit about your hoof care philosophy. (laughs) That's a big question. (laughs) It's a really big question. Um, well, first off, thank you for having me. It's been, yeah, it's been, we've had such a great day, haven't we, so far? Yeah. Um, and people have brought some really, really interesting horses. So it's been, it's been fascinating to look at them and to meet people and talk about hooves over here. Um, uh, my hoof care philosophy, I suppose, is keep it as simple as possible and intervene as little as possible. Um, but overall, the soundness of the horse is my absolute top priority. Um, and that's really what drives everything that I've done in the past. 
Yeah, and that sort of ties into my next question, too, of uh, why do you think that knowledge about hooves is important for owners, too, uh, not just farriers or trimmers? I think because, um, particularly with a barefoot horse, but it's true of any horse, if we have that basic knowledge about what a healthy hoof looks like, what a healthy horse looks like, and what good movement looks like, we can actually ensure that our horses have uh, long and injury-free lives and are not only not only able to work with us but have you know the best life that we can possibly give them domestically so it's it's a kind of it's a very basic a basic but really important principle of horse care it's as basic as good nutrition in my opinion and it's as basic as you know riding correctly or good saddle fit is just uh, fundamental to the care of the horse yeah i agree obviously i mean that's a huge passion of mine um so why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and journey in hoof care and how you got involved (laughs) with it (laughs) um so i got i got involved in in barefoot um in probably around what from a sort of professional point of view in about 2004 Um, and I'd come across barefoot horses before that but I hadn't been very impressed because I'd seen a lot of horses that were not particularly comfortable and not moving particularly well and they didn't seem particularly fit and they didn't seem particularly healthy or happy Um, and the owners didn't seem too happy with it either so that put me off for a few years because I didn't like how it was turning out for the horses if you like. Um, I like the idea of it and I like the principle that it was natural and that they weren't, weren't shod, but I didn't like what I was seeing. Um, and what changed in 2004, I guess, was that I had um, two horses with with really badly deteriorating feet, one with um, navicular and one with um, bad nutritional problems and cracks that we didn't have and our vets and our farriers didn't have the tools to fix um and fortuitously for me at the same time i got another horse who um when we took his shoes off he had fantastic feet and everything for him was easy he was just really sound really healthy and could do anything without shoes straight away um and that really got me thinking hang on I've always been told that horses need to choose to work, but he's so good and he's so competent and he's so happy. Why? What's he got that the other horses haven't got? Why is it so? Why has it all gone so wrong for them and it's gone so right for him? And so that really started me off asking questions about how I could get the feet on my other horses as good as the feet on my best horse, if you like. So that kind of started Rockley Farm Rehab, or was that? No, that was that was. As it happened, it was when I was at Rockley, but it was when we were just, um, you know, we'd we'd moved there and we were, you know, living there and working there and farming it. But it, it wasn't designed for um, horse rehab. That was something that came later, and it happened kind of org- organically as um, as my knowledge of hoof care developed and as the things that I was trying with my own horses were yielding good results. So, how long have you actually done the rehab itself? Um, Probably 2005 was when I started. That was the f- when I had the first the first person who sent me a horse because they'd seen that my other horse, you know, m- my other two problem horses had Im- had improved a lot, and they were like, "Oh well, can you can you try it with this horse?" Um, and then it it kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. And so, what um, what kind of horses do you usually see? What kind of injuries? Or- oh, uh, we see a massive range in terms of like every possible breed. And, you know, every possible discipline. So we have horses that we have, have, have horses that have um, been race horses. We have horses that do dressage, horses that event, horses that do riding club, horses that are family ponies, you know, every range. But in terms of the injuries, um, what we specialise in for rehabilitation are horses with what in the olden days would have been called navicular. And what nowadays, because most of the horses who come to us have a, an MRI, um, what nowadays is usually a combination of deep flexor tendon and collateral ligament injuries with related bone damage. 
So he was diagnosed as a six-year-old with navicular and pedalostitis um, on x-ray. So we assumed soft tissue damage um, because of the damage that we saw to the bone, but we didn't bother to do an MRI scan because it wouldn't have changed any of the treatment or the prognosis. She went off to the Animal Health Trust in October of 2015, so this is just almost a year after I first got her, so I hadn't really done all that much to it. And finally, the final diagnosis there was she'd got a, a tear in the deep digital flexor tendon on the front right, which was the one she was laying at, laying at but also proximal sense, suspensory desmitis on the back end. They really said that the, the outlook her was very poor, pretty much advised me to put her to sleep there and then. His diagnosis um, was side bone actually. Um, he suddenly went quite lame, six tenths lame on his right fore. Um, that was a year before he went to Rockley Farm. Um, and he had an MRI scan eventually. And yeah, his diagnosis was he had side bone in both of his fronts. The, the right front, the one he was very lame on, um, was the worst one. Perhaps some ligament damage to one of the small ligaments in his right front hoof. Yeah, I mean, I, I had basically, I kind of, because my horse was insured and I'd had every, um, you know, veterinary procedure and analysis done. So he'd had an, an X-ray and he'd had an MRI and he'd had a nerve block and then he'd had a whole range of treatments ranging from kind of different kinds of shoes to, I don't remember the name, but kind of injection drugs into the feet and rest and not rest and it, it basically we come to we've been trying for it for over a year and we just come to the end of the line so I just had no alternative at that stage you know it was either turn left to the to the euthanasia or try a different route so that was my situation. Can you tell us a little bit about how you rehab those horses what protocol or approach you sort of take as they come in well obviously their shoes come off um nutrition is really fundamental um and i'm lucky because i can control that quite well at home because we make our own forage and i know the mineral deficiencies that we need to correct so i can put that in place at day one um and i have to say nowadays horses tend to come on a much better nutritional footing than they did say 10 years ago um but I put them all on the same diet from the day they arrive uh, and the same diet as my own horses have. So that gets that gets put in place, you know, immediately. And if they have shoes on, their shoes come off immediately. And then it's a case of using the tracks that we have, which have a whole range of conformable surfaces and in hand and ridden exercise to improve movement and build up the strength of the foot. Awesome. And what percentage about what percentage of the horses that you see leave sounder than when they came okay so um we did um a couple of years ago we i've always kept records of the horses that have come and i follow them as far as i can it's not always possible but i try and follow them once they go home um and so we did uh, a couple of veterinary friends and i put together all the records that we had of the horses that had come through Rockley since um, 2007, uh, 2006, 2007, and where we could follow them up, we did. And we um, we had about an 83% success rate in them returning to the same level of work and maintaining that level of work going forward. Obviously, we lost track of some of them and you know there were a percentage who were in work but it wasn't at the same level so they maybe had been eventing and they were now doing um hacking out or you know trail riding um, but the majority go back to the same level of work or higher and what do you think um like when you see a rehab horse can you predict if they'll be successful or is there a factor that you think really influences the success of a horse's rehab well, there are some things that you would expect to influence it that don't. So um, often people worry, oh, my horse is uh, 16 or 17 or 18 or 19, and I'm, I think they're too old to be a rehab horse. That actually isn't usually a problem. Um, a lot of horses who come to us in their as like late teenagers do incredibly well. What 
does seem to set horses back as if they've been worked long term on painkillers. That, particularly with soft tissue injuries, does seem to sometimes mean that you have such a severe injury that it's it's not amenable to rehab. And so those are pretty much the only um, sorts of horses that I would now say to people, I wouldn't think rehab is necessarily a good idea. I'm not saying I wouldn't try it, but you'd have to be you'd have to be more gloomy about a horse that's been worked on on um, long term anti inflammatories. Um, other than that, you can't really tell what from looking at them (laughs) yeah I wish you could (laughs) right and do you think that there's anything that you do specifically that contributes more to their success in terms of do you think that nutrition plays the largest role or movement or do you think it's all sort of I certainly think for for the horses that we see because they have a biomechanical lameness the thing that is absolutely crucial is the work on conformable surfaces because you know very often people have had their horses on a good diet Um, Very often they've been out of shoes quite a long time and often what makes the biggest difference is the palmer hoof receiving enough stimulus to really build and strengthen. And once you've got that, that really marks a turning point for most of these horses. Um, And usually that's something that um, I attribute to, uh, to the time that they spend on the tracks. And is there a horse that you can think of that really surprised you when you were rehabbing it one that maybe you thought one that maybe you thought wouldn't you know come back sound and did well I used to I used to think that about every single horse (laughs) I used to pretty much every horse that arrived I'd hit a real low point after two or three weeks going oh no this horse is never going to improve and I'd be moaning to my husband oh this is completely useless I might as well just give up and then you know a week later the horse is like oh I feel I feel a lot better so so very often I sort of I don't, I'm more resilient now because I know that actually whatever I feel about it is largely irrelevant and the horses are like, please leave me alone and put me on the tracks and I'll just get trucking and you can come back and I'll be fine. Um, But yeah, I I initially was amazed that, I was amazed at any of them. (laughs) They never cease to amaze me, to be honest. They are incredible. And what's really incredible is that, you know, once we remove obstacles, they just grow these incredible feet and they would love to move as you know in the best possible way and they would love to do more mileage and they would love to you know grow fantastically strong feet and once you remove the obstacles they're like yes thank you very much and and that's what i'll do (laughs) so yeah they are incredible they're all incredible actually yeah i mean it was an amazing transformation and you could almost see his feet changing by the week um in front of your eyes so he went down in the November and he was sound within eight weeks. So he was healed first at about week six um, and sound by week eight. And at that point, Nick didn't have the same surface that she does now. It was just sort of um, a hard sound surface. There was no rubber or anything on top. So the test was actually a pretty good one in terms of testing his soundness. And he's been sound ever since. So we're coming to our eighth year now. <laughs> so he was he was being ridden by all and sundry sort of four or five hours a day three or four days a week um and then i brought him back over here and um in the two years um after he came back we did dressage to elementary level so affiliated dressage including some championships um he came fourth at the pre championships in dressage um i did some eventing with him so he's he's a very keen jumper not particularly talented but he loves it so we did some 80 centimeter events um and a lot of long distance rides as well so with nick and some of the other ex rockley horses we did the whole of a, a long distance trail called the ridgeway which was a three-day ride um, and Pachola and I have just hacked miles and miles around the British countryside um, and he's not had a lame day since coming back from Rockley. That's amazing. Uh, he's been absolutely perfect, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, I mean, the story is a really happy, well, it's a really happy one for me because, you know, he went from being a terminal horse to back to doing every kind of competition that he'd ever done, you know, so he, that was full eventing in the UK and also um, kind of we do uh, various types of hunting in the UK as well and he used to do that as well afterwards as a you know without shoes on a, on a two horse day so that's basically going from like 11 o'clock to 4 30 on all the different kinds of terrain but you know if I put in the work and the feed right and the care you know that horse does everything he's ever done 
to a really, really good level. So, you know, he's, it's, it's, I would never have believed it, to be honest with you. Um, he went, when did he go? He went three years ago. Um, so he's been pretty much in full work for the last two years. And in general, I have found that the more work he does, actually the better he is. Uh, now he does um, pretty much everything. We're jumping you know, at least once a week, maybe twice a week now as well. And he's just going from strength to strength at the moment, which is, you know, really pleasing after, <laughs> after all these <laughs> months and months and months of getting him sound. Um, he's doing his first uh, affiliated jumping show this Sunday. Yeah, and you were saying that you see a lot of horses, obviously with that navicular diagnosis, who have soft tissue injuries. <clears throat> and obviously we hear, I know I've heard that, you know, if you have a soft tissue injury, you need to have box rest or stall rest. You mm. don't want them to move because mm. you want to mm. heal that injury. But obviously you are healing that injury with movement. With movement yeah. So can you say a little bit about how that that's working? Okay, well, um, the way I usually describe it, because I think it's something that resonates with our own experience is that it with a lot of these sources it's it's a repetitive strain injury type problem rather than um sometimes there's a sudden accident or event that, is, that has dramatically made things worse but it's never something that has just happened overnight it's a slow build up of bad movement and a weakening of the foot over time so rather like with us it's not a case it's not really um the solution is not just to stop moving. The solution is to stop the bad movement and to encourage good movement. And what that then allows you to do is to protect the injury while strengthening the other areas of the foot in, in the case of the, the horse with, a, for instance, a deep flexor tendon diagnosis. So you're taking the stress off the tendon by allowing the foot to move in a more biomechanically safe and appropriate way. Um, you're also allowing the horse to move in a way that it's not having to compensate through the rest of its body. So... Um, a lot of secondary issues, neck pain, back pain, um, loss of hind limb um, movement, good hind limb movement, a lot of those knock-on problems can also improve at the same time. Yeah, and and you also, you know, uh, as a health care provider, my world sort of is focused around trimming or thinking about trimming and you uh don't trim anymore um and which absolutely fascinates me and I love that um so can you talk to us a little bit about how these horses are self-trimming and what you mean when you you know write your blog posts and say <laughs> celery I love that <laughs> okay well um I suppose starting with the horses that I see the most of they usually have very weak feet and the problem with trimming is that all you can do is take stuff away. Um, the problem that most of these horses have is they don't have enough of something. They are missing structures in their foot. They're missing digital cushion strength. They're missing frog depth. They're missing good heel structure. Um, they're missing so much that you can't provide with a trim. It would be great if you could, but all a trim can do, unfortunately, is remove structure. And usually with these horses, um, removing stuff is is not productive for them. So I kind of backed away from trimming initially just because there wasn't anything to trim and then really because um, what I found was that as I allowed the horses to move, they were able to um, develop their feet really rapidly and strengthen their feet really rapidly and then trimming became kind of irrelevant because they were improving so fast. So self-trimming came about by accident it was never a goal or an intention it was just something that you know trimming was no longer being particularly useful for these horses so I stopped doing it um, and I suppose with my own horses it was something that I I kind of uh, drifted away from because again they were in regular work their feet didn't change their feet didn't look any different their feet didn't get long um, and the less I did in terms of trimming the better they were able to self-regulate their own response so if they were in hard work they grew more foot if they were in reduced work they grew less foot and their feet were also able to respond to changes in terrain and changes in mileage um, and in to respond to injury and their feet were so clever they were way cleverer than any they came up with solutions in 
basically. They were coming up with hoof care solutions that were more innovative than anything I could come up with. So I just kind of stood back and let them get on with it. Right after we ended our interview, Nick immediately remembered that she forgot to talk about what celery means in terms of self-trimming. I'll let a Rockley rehab owner explain what celery means. Yes. Nick kind of says, don't um, touch your horse's feet with anything sharper than a stick of celery. Yeah, and you, I mean, you're talking about how fast these feet change, and you only see them for a short amount of time. How Mm. long are they usually? Yeah, okay, so they're with me for 12 weeks. So they have time to grow about half a hoof capsule, which isn't a huge amount, but it's usually enough to make a big difference in terms of their foot balance and their soundness. And at that point, they can go home and their owners can carry on with them. And um, by the time they've grown a full hoof capsule, they usually have much, much better foot balance that their owners are, and they are able to carry on with. And how do you document those the progress while they're at Rockley? So um, I take photos and video on the day they arrive. And then along with the, up, with, with the vet and the owner, um, we review them at four weeks and eight weeks and um, assess how they're doing. And obviously the owners come and visit as well. So, you know, we'll we'll um, look at horses in the school. We'll film them on a hard surface in, and see how their feet are landing. Um, and we're looking always for improvements in that, which then lead to improvements in soundness. Yeah. And so what's the, the ideal landing that you're looking for in the video? So I'm looking for a heel first landing when you look at the dorsal palmer hoof balance. Uh, and I'm looking for... Um, an even landing on both heels when you look at the horse medialaterally. Um, yeah. Because those, the loss of those two is what I commonly see with um, deep flexor tendon injuries. So with deep flexor tendon injuries, it's usually a toe first landing. With uh, collateral ligament injuries, it's usually a, a, a lack of medial lateral balance. And so improving those is usually the best way to, or the best indication that the horse is improving in soundness. And so, you know, obviously seeing the progress through these videos and documenting it and having owners that come back and, and ride and compete and do all these great things. Have you changed the culture at all in your area? Do you think, and, or at least with the vets in, in the doom and gloom that we hear for a navicular diagnosis, has that changed at all? I think, um, I've seen a massive change since I started doing this because when I started with my own horse he had been diagnosed with navicular in I guess 97 or 98 and at that point it was a kind of well this horse is going to degenerate and then he's going to die and da, da, da. Um, And he was still I took his shoes off in like 2004 and he was still in work literally up until the day he died he died of melanomas um, at the age of 25 so from having had a death sentence at the age of 16 he had you know nine years of really active life um that i would never have expected him to have and what i think is is great now is that when people are told that their horse is lame because it's got a deep flexor tendon injury or navicular or collateral ligament damage it's very much owner led but owners now know or at least can easily find out um, a huge amount of information about horses that have had a successful um, prognosis. And I think for owners, that's fantastic. It's great for vets too, in the sense that um, we always take horses on um, veterinary referral. So their vets need to agree before we'll take a horse. So they are, they may or may not be supportive of what we do in the sense that they may they may be familiar with what we do or they may have never heard of us before but they get to see the horse they get to assess the horse before and after and once they've seen a horse improve out of shoes they're usually very receptive even if they think well it's only going to work for that one horse you know they're very receptive to um to the idea that for that horse it's been a it's been a good thing um so it's a case of um, each horse and each owner really being an advocate for other people in a similar position. Yeah, and I'm really thankful for all your blog posts and your books. And that, I mean, that's been a huge thing for me um, in terms of education and encouragement and uh, just learning about the health and soundness of the hoof. Um, 
so in in terms of that, do you have any parting words or words of encouragement <laughs> for owners or, you know, somebody who's maybe struggling with a horse that has a navicular diagnosis and I think I, I think the most important thing to take from all this is to remember that whether you're shoeing a horse or not shoeing a horse and whatever you're doing in terms of dealing with your horse, whatever treatments or therapies have been advised to you, you kind of need to remember that everybody's doing it with your horse's best interest at heart. It's very, very easy to end up polarised and to end up with one hoof kept practitioner saying one thing and a farrier saying something else and, and, and people becoming... Um, contentious about something that really should be a collaborative approach and uh, I think if we can maintain a level of discussion and collaboration and remember that we are all in it for the sake of the horse then uh, we remember that there are lots of different ways to keep our horses as sound as possible there's not one right way um, and hopefully we can learn from each other and um, all help each other to get to a, a great place with our horses yeah well i thank you so much for coming all the way to the states and it's doing my pleasure with us we've had and, such a great day and thanks for the interview you're um, very welcome and it's lovely to see you again yeah you too and i hope to get back over there <laughs> i some hope point. so we'll, we'll, I would love we'll that. welcome you with open arms for sure well, thank you so much <laughs> and i will absolutely send this to you and you can okay it and hopefully that's not too loud in the background <laughs> thanks a few weeks ago, on April 6, 2019, Nick came over for a clinic in the States. It was a really great day with a bunch of really awesome hoof care providers and owners, and we got to spend a lot of time evaluating the feet and the movement on various horses. Hey everyone, it's Alicia here. We're in the car and we're on our way to Long Island, New York for the clinic with Nick Barker from Rockley Farm Rehab in England. I'm just really excited to spend the weekend with a bunch of other hoof obsessed people and get to catch up with Nick and I will keep you all updated with some clips from this weekend. Thank you everybody. Thank Sorry, you for inviting me. Um, <laughs> no, this is great. This is really fun. Um, basically what we're going to do today is we're going to um, do some filming with all the horses that are here. We're going to watch that inside so everybody will have a chance to sit down and warm up and get a drink and stuff so the plan is to do some filming first thing when we filmed all the horses and we've seen them all and we've heard about them all then we'll go in and do some filming that will take us I guess the whole of the morning so um, at some point after that we'll have a break and then this afternoon I would quite like to also look at horses on a circle and talk about improving movement and changing movement one of my favorite parts of Nick's clinic was having the ability to geek out a bit about hoof biomechanics with others that were just as nerdy about it as I am. We started by filming the horses in slow motion, walking down the driveway, and then spent time evaluating the footage while hanging out and chatting in the living room. So what do people think about this landing on Itchy? I think he's flat. I think he's, I think she's a bit better than flat. Yeah. If you look at the look at the toe, if the toe flicks up and it's the last thing to come down, um, that's a pretty encouraging okay. sign. Yeah. I wouldn't say that this is a really strong heel first landing. I would. It's the sort of landing that if I saw it on a rehab horse at kind of four weeks, I'd be pretty happy. If I saw it on one of my horses at home, I'd be like, oh, yeah. mm, something's gone a bit wrong. What you want with a horse, um, you want the horse to be confident loading the back of the foot. That's what you want. Because if a horse is confident loading the back of its foot on a hard surface like that, then you're getting frog stimulus. You're getting, um, therefore you're getting the ability for the horse to build the digital cushion, which is in the back of its foot. You don't get a stronger digital cushion without frog stimulus. And you don't get frog stimulus without the back of the foot loading. That's also where all the shock absorption happens. So by putting the horse on a hard surface, we're, we're really testing them and saying, right, can you cut, have you got enough ability to absorb concussion that I can work you on a hard surface? So um, all of the shock absorbing structures for the horse are in the back of the foot. So you need them to be able to engage the back of the foot in order to have any useful shock absorbing ability. The 
frogs are not awesome in front right now. Yeah. And that's a big thing, you know. Uh, any sort of pain in the back of the foot can stop a horse from landing well. well it yeah. could be something as drastic as a deep flexor tendon lesion. It could be as something as apparently minor as a superficial injury or a bit of thrush. Yeah. But it can still, over time, lead to problem. an equally bad problem. So it's, it's, yeah. it's well worth paying attention to, you know, even the superficial stuff. With medial lateral balance, you want both, in walk, you want both heels to load pretty much at the same time. Yeah. Certainly when you're filming at this sort of speed, it should look as if the foot's just going down fairly square. Um, once you're in higher speeds, you do have, particularly in trot in a straight line, they'll have more of a lateral landing because the legs are coming in under the body more. But in walk, when they're kind of trucking along like this, it should look pretty even. Overall, the clinic was a really great day, and if Nick ever comes to your area, I strongly suggest that you sign up for one of her clinics. If you can't, she has two books available. One is Feet First by Nick Barker, and the other is Performance Hoof, Performance Horse, also by Nick. Um, in terms of Nick, uh, she is she's brilliant. She's so honest. She will never promise to do something that she can't do. You know, she she's incredibly intelligent. She really wants to make sure she's researched and understand why things work, not just go blindly ahead and do them. Um, and she's got such an incredible wealth of knowledge now about barefoot horses and about how to get horses performing at their best with no shoes on. Um, and you know, she's very generous with that knowledge. So. I feel um, blessed to have met Nick and to be able to continue to, to see her occasionally and, and quiz her and, and um, you know, just be able to benefit from her knowledge, really. Um, Nick's one of those unusual people whereby she's actually really good with animals and with people, which I've found in my encounters um, is something that can be quite rare. It's hard to get that um, the, the connection with, with both sides. She has like a lot of empathy and totally understands exactly what you're going through and puts you at ease. And there's always a, there's a video of came in on the Rockley page, and it just sort of embodies everything that Nick is. She was bringing them in from the field, and it came in was the last one up, and it's just her voice. He, he was the he he came up the very last, and um, she just the way that she said it. She said, "You're late," and I can just feel that warmth. Um, in, her, in her voice, and albeit I'd never met her at this point, um, I just knew that I'd done the right thing and he was being looked after, which obviously is a massive thing for me. For anybody rehabbing horses, it, is a very, it, it can be a very long and tricky road. I've found you know, a lot of support, probably most of it online, um, like in various Facebook groups, um, particularly from um, Alicia herself. Um, on the uh, the barefoot barefoot for a navicular page. Sometimes it's really comforting to to share your story, and you know you get little sort of hints and tips for for your uh, yourself because it never for me I don't think I'll ever relax a hundred percent about my horse. Buddy, you know he has helped me transform my life. You know if he hadn't, if, I thought it was at the end of the world when he went lame. But you know when they say everything happens for a reason. It did, because it brought some amazing people into my life. You know, at the end of the day, you know, came and made a big recovery from that. And sometimes it's that not giving up. I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person. And chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too. So we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.